Welcome to API Conversations. I'm Marsha Barnhart, API's Chief of Investigations, and your host for this Conversations episode. Today, my guest is author, blogger, and podcaster Joshua Kutchen. Joshua recently published a book, which we'll discuss at length, entitled A Trojan Feast, The Food and Drink Offerings of Aliens, Fairies, and Sasquatch. I first became aware of Joshua through one of his Weird Words and Brass Beats blog entries, which he titled The Magical Swimming Pool of Ufology's Future. In it, he discussed his thoughts about the inadequacy of the nuts-and-bolts approach toward the study of UFOs and other anomalies. His premise was that, at least at this juncture, science can't reasonably study the subject of attached high strangeness and other paranormal trappings associated with UFOs by merely using the scientific materialist method. In his stated opinion, the materialistic paradigm is broken. Looking into the author of this blog entry, I found out about his book, and it intrigued me. Of course, the Aerial Phenomenon Investigations team does not investigate sightings of Sasquatch or of fairies, but I can assure you, on many occasions, UFO cases we have investigated do have high strangeness incidences associated with the sightings or experiences. These are very difficult cases to investigate. If the standard is to approach a UFO investigation like a nuts-and-bolts forensic case, which is our typical modus operandi, then high strangeness incidences create an almost impossible bar to hurdle. Joshua Kutchen's book is an in-depth study of a very narrow niche within this paranormal UFO and anomaly genre. In fact, I don't think a compendium of this information has even existed, at least in modern times, up to this point. I highly recommend his book, A Trojan Feast, his blog, Weird Words and Brass Beats, and his podcast, Where Did the Road Go? All of that info and specific links to his works can be found in our attached show notes. Here now is my interview with Joshua Kutchen, conducted July 6, 2016. What I'd like to start with, Joshua, is if you will tell the audience a little bit about who you are. Well, I'd be happy to. Uh, I uh, am a... Uh, professional musician. That's my day job. Uh, with a long-standing interest in Fortiana, uh, I suppose that a lot of the the genesis for that was uh, growing up as a kid. I was sort of a monster kid. I was always interested in <laughs> in, in things that go bump in the night. Uh, I think my first uh, film that I ever saw was the 1933 King Kong with dinosaurs and you know giant gorilla and all those things. So that really kindled an interest in uh, in in the unknown in a lot of ways in me. Um, but as far as, you know, actually having any, any experiences, unlike a lot of people in this field, I have a relatively small handful of actual things that I think have happened to me. And I'm generally of the uh, mindset where I try to, uh, write them off as best I can. Um, but, uh, I was, uh, I've always had an interest in these things. They were never, uh, they were never shunned by my family. Uh, I was always, you know, getting books about UFOs and Bigfoot and that sort of thing out of the library. And for whatever reason, and I'm not entirely sure why, um, I had sort of an interest rekindled about four years ago in this subject, and it was really, uh, it was really uh, rekindled in me in, in a big way. And I just began devouring all sorts of uh, paranormal podcasts and really uh, devoting a lot of time to these things. And uh, before I knew it, I was I had this idea for something that maybe uh, could be a book that someone should write. And then when nobody wrote it, I said, "Well, I guess it's up to me to write it." And that's where I find myself today. So, uh, so you know, uh, whenever I can, I I uh, make my money doing music, and this is sort of a, a passion project for me. Just being involved in UFOs and uh, in the unexplained in general. 
Uh huh. Uh huh. Well, you know, I want to talk about your blog. I want to talk about your book, The Trojan Feast, and I want to get into some of your Fortean interests and some of your beliefs and what is ufology's future. These are things I would like to get at. Now, you mentioned that you, or at least you skirted around the subject of having had some type of anomalous experience or a range of or a background of such things, yes? Yes, a a relatively small handful of, of experiences. Most of what I have experienced, I would tend to qualify into uh, I would tend to tend to group it into ghost experiences, all and although I don't know the the, the further I get into the unexplained, I'm not sure that it's not just one giant uh, fortean bag, <laughs> as as it were. Um, I saw what I would contend is probably the ghost of a young Civil War Civil War soldier at uh, Stonewall Jackson's house in Virginia, that was uh, in my uh, early college years. <clears throat> Um, but actually the one thing that I keep on coming back to that was really quite fascinating was during my, uh, when my home, my childhood home was having some additions made to it, we would find, uh, stacks of quarters all around the house in the most unlikely of places. I remember one time, uh, while we were working on the house, we actually pulled a dictionary out from the shelf that hadn't been off the shelf in, in God knows how long. And there were a stack of four quarters. They were always, they would always be stacked in fours. Um, we would find them sort of around the construction site as well. I don't think it was a, uh, I don't think it was a whimsical contractor, and I certainly don't think that it was my mother. Um, interesting to me how it sort of has a lot of echoes with fairy lore. Um, those two are the main things that I've experienced. I've had, you know, as as I think anybody has, if they really looked in their lives, I've had some very profound synchronicities as well. Um, but most of what I've experienced has been in the sort of that odd uh, spirit uh, spirit phenomena. I haven't really seen anything in terms of in terms of uh, anomalous lights in the sky. Even though every now and then I look at the sky and hope I see something, I still have not been that fortunate yet. Now you were talking about these quarters. Uh, what made you go to uh, you know fairies and and that type of thing? What in your background triggered that response in you? That's actually a really great question and one that I'd never really considered. I mean, it does have that sort of um it does have that sort of whimsical house spirit phenomena that you find with fairies. I mean, I think it's interesting that um the house at the time was being added on to, so it was sort of during a uh non-structural liminal phase in the house's life and therefore in our lives. Um but also I I think about all the ways in which uh in a lot of especially Celtic mythology uh, that offerings would be left out for the fairies to bless homes or to uh, to leave some sort of uh, offering in return. So that's, that's that's probably where I saw the parallels. But you know, as with so many things, this really does dovetail with other phenomena. I mean, I, I think that if you had a spirit researcher hearing this story, they would probably ascribe it to a poltergeist phenomena. Mm. Hmm. You know, uh, reading your book, I just got your book, and I'm about uh, a quarter of the way through it. And uh, I find it very interesting, and we're going to talk about uh, your book called The Trojan Feast. And, um, you know, I had kind of forgotten that back when I was a very young girl, I thought... I saw little fairies, and I was exceedingly interested in uh, Gulliver's Travels and Tales of Lilliputians. I was very, very interested in that. One time I remember when I was a young child, it was Christmas time, and I went out to take a look at the the presents under the tree. And um, in the linoleum just outside my door was, I swear to God, this tiny little, looked like somebody had cut out a tiny footprint like they needed to replace the sole of a little elf uh, shoe. And I was captivated by that. And last but not least, it triggered a memory, your book, with fairies and everything, about how my sister would always say, look at the window. The little people are looking in. They're going to talk to you. Now, why she would say that, I do not know. I do not know where that came from. She since died, and I couldn't ask her about that. But having read your book brought up a flashback of memories. And, and I think people, when they read your book, are going to start remembering how much when we were younger, fairies and goblins and things of that nature were actually talked about. And they hardly are anymore. Absolutely. Uh, if you don't mind my inquiring, uh, where did you uh, grow up and what is your family heritage? Well, oh, yeah, this is perfect. I grew up in Oregon, and my people are from Wales and Scotland and Ireland. 
<laughs> nice, nice, nice. Well, that's you know that's in, in a lot of ways uh, that it, it doesn't surprise me. And we uh, we we often hear stories of children seeing these things. And of course, as one grows older, people tend to not see you know things that they would ascribe as being fairies or or wee people or little folk. Um, and of course, you know, the, the, so many questions sort of arise out of that. I mean, do we grow out of being able to see something, or, or are we just, uh, are we just, you know, uh, playful children? Uh, at the same time, you know, whenever we see those as children, what are we really seeing? Are we l- really seeing, you know, uh, fey folk, fairy folk in the, you know, the uh, the sense of the British Isles, the sense that people native to that. Uh, part of the world would un- understand them, or are we seeing something that's another uh, another face on the die, as it were, of the unexplained? Are we seeing something that you know? If we're <laughs> do grown ups see the same thing that children see and and jump to UFOs, uh, you know, little strange lights or strange dancing lights or or small beings, um, you know, it it really does raise a lot of questions. Uh, you know, and, and it's interesting also this uh, this footprint that you saw because it brings to mind the way that. Uh, you know, a lot of a lot of a lot of these different areas of uh, of inquiry, if, if it's Sasquatch or UFOs or, or Fae folk, um, tend to be very hard to put your finger on in terms of having a material existence, and yet they still persistently leave material, physical uh, after effects in their wake. And it's one of the more uh, one of the more intriguing contradictions to me in my study of this because I, I think that's I think that there's something to that that uh, that perhaps we're overlooking there might be a, some sort of clue in there now if you ask me what that clue is I'm not entirely sure what it is um, I have some suspicions but uh, but I think it's interesting the way that this sort of tends to straddle the line between something that is uh, non-physical and physical at the same time well that's kind of the old conundrum uh, do we believe because we see or do we see because we believe now I spent some time in Iceland I'm when, when I was in the Air Force I was there for a year and you know I'm telling you the Icelanders the grown-up Icelanders absolutely without a doubt many of them believe in in little people and uh, they will order you know as you'd mentioned in your book they will order how they build a highway so as not to upset the wee folk I forget what they called them in Icelandic but um, these people were the dead hu- serious the, folk, the uh, hidden folk ah, okay well it's it is a real thing there, and uh, now you could, then you have to examine, did that come from the fact that their culture is very open about that, and it's ingrained in them, and so naturally they're going to just talk that way, even though there isn't a real we folk, or if there are actual little people that has so ingrained itself in the lore that they pick up and understand this is a real thing. It's not going to be one of those things you can probably suss out. Yes. Oh, I, I completely agree. And, you know, we straddle, um, we straddle a, a precarious line ourselves when we talk about this, because it's, it's so hard to engage people in, in subjects about stuff like, the possible objective reality of of elemental earth spirits like fairies, because it's very easy to trip over into um, <laughs> some subcultures that sort of make my toes curl, if you if you don't mind my saying so. Um, you know, there there are, there are a lot of people who uh, tend to these sort of vague areas of interpretation and the sort of uh, ancient mythology to sort of push a more a new age agenda. Not that there isn't something that is is legitimate and very true in the biggest in the very truest sense to the new age but sometimes you get into people who automatically want to spiral off into talking about um talking about uh, you know the raising of consciousness and vibrations and such and that's sort of where I tend to draw the line i think that there's something to do with these sort of phenomena with consciousness but when it becomes this uh this this <laughs> this constant uh, prophesying that you know next year we're all going to raise unto the next level is where I sort of have to go. Well, maybe we should maybe we should be a little bit more reserved about that. Yeah, yeah. Let's put our um, our BS meters to work here, folks. But you don't you know you don't really know. Um, there's there's an awful lot of stuff that is unexplained. I I like you get a little hinky when I hit some of the Google Plus sites and I hear all these messages from you know an entity that's being channeled. I don't even go there. It could be legit, but my BS meter goes wonk 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 wonk. I don't trust any of that, and um, that's fine if somebody does. But I I feel you. Yeah, I, I always have to. I always try to look at if the person 
espousing this has something to gain from it. And that's if they do, I kind of tend to back off. I mean, to be clear, though, I, I do I do maintain what I would like to qualify as sort of a rabid agnosticism about a lot of these things. I mean, I, I suspect that the people who are entirely into New Age interpretations of uh, of unexplained phenomena – have a lot more correct than the people who are in the physical interpretation have. And I suspect that the people who have physical interpretations of unexplained phenomena have a lot more correct than the the New Age community would like to agree. I think that the truth really does lie somewhere in the middle. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yes, absolutely. Now, I would like to segue into your book. Um, tell me about the Trojan Feast. What took you to that particular teeny, narrow genre of this whole subject? How did you get there? Well, yeah, this is sort of a different angle because I've I've been asked this question a lot, but this sort of just sort of occurred to me. Um, you know, I've always I've always been interested in the similarities between uh, the fairy mythology and modern uh, UFO reports. A lot of the a lot of the uh, the pageantry of the two seem to have quite a bit in common. And at the same time, I was always terrified for the longest time of the abduction scenario. So noting that there were similarities, I I suppose perhaps in some sense, and this is something that I, like I said, I just now put together, but I suppose in some sense I was looking for defense mechanisms. (laughs) And if there is this much shared similarity between alien lore and and, and, uh, fairy lore, and anyone listening out there, I don't use the term lore – Disparagingly, I'm just using that as a term to encompass the, the 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 literature that's out there between the two. Then perhaps hold on, let me jump in right here. Oh, certainly. So now you're telling me that the genesis of this project essentially came from some fear of yours of being abducted, and you wanted to figure out how you could possibly protect yourself from that. Well, I've never quite articulated it that way, and it just occurred to me that perhaps – because it is odd that I focused on this one little niche, which is uh, this idea that in fairy lore, if you weren't – if you were approached by the fairies and you were given food and you ate of their food, you would be trapped with them forever. So I suppose perhaps I was just listing a – going through a laundry list of ways to protect myself from unexplained phenomena. Um, Ironically, this whole journey of being – being involved in these subjects has actually sort of acted as a sort of therapy. This the whole abduction scenario doesn't quite terrify me as much uh, anymore for whatever reason. But uh, yeah, so I I had zeroed in on this one thing, which I noticed uh, being a recurring motif in not only fairy lore but also sort of in abduction lore. Um, there were uh, there were plenty of there are plenty of uh, cases where uh, aliens give uh, food to abductees, and uh, I wondered if there was some sort of connection there. But my true light bulb moment. The moment where I said that there was something worth looking into here was when I was reading uh, this book called Raincoast Sasquatch by J. Robert Alley. It's a book that chronicles Sasquatch sightings along the southern coast of Alaska. And he mentions that among certain native tribes in the area, if you were approached by a bookwuss, which is a woodsman, a hairy man of the woods, Sasquatch basically, and you were given uh, some dried salmon to eat, you should not eat it or else you would be trapped with the book was forever. So that was my moment when I said, okay, this is this is a few too many similarities with this specific motif uh, to, to ignore. Perhaps there is something worth uh, sort of digging at. So I pulled on that thread and out of that tumbled really a wealth of information that I didn't expect to uh, – I didn't really expect to find. And as with so many of these things, once you start looking at one tiny area, it sort of spider webs out into other things. So if you look at the offerings of uh, entities, by which I mean uh, generally in this case fairies, aliens, and Sasquatch, to their uh, captives, you have to sort of start looking at other uh, possible scenarios. You have to look at a, uh, a food offering sexual connection because all of these things, fairies, aliens, and Sasquatch, are purportedly very much interested in reproduction. You have to look at the possibility of there being a connection between uh, aliens and fairies and food and Sasquatch and sleep paralysis, which is you know what the scientific establishment often wants to, to trot out. Um, and then you have to also look at uh, another subject, which uh, is probably controversial in some circles, but the idea of entheogens, the idea of foods that, according to uh, native wisdom, are actually given by the gods to mankind to uh, to commune with the other, to commune with the the spirit world. So uh, for, from that one like humble little idea that maybe that there's something to this food taboo uh, spirals out this entire sort of survey and analysis of the types of food that aliens, fairies, and Sasquatch have reportedly offered people and uh, 
the possible, you know, examination of any trends and motifs that there might be there within. Yeah. Now, why do they offer foodstuffs? What is the reason for that? I mean, it makes it sound like they're just another type of living entity making its way through the world, interacting in its very elegant way with its own kind, and interacting on occasion with this other species that cohabits with it. And in that way, it sounds like, well, why don't we see those things all the time then? Exactly. I think that um, I think that your interpretation of the motivation behind this really sort of depends on what school of thought you come from. If you're interested in the sort of uh, mainstream psychosocial hypothesis, it has to do with traditionally held hospitality rights, uh, held especially in the West, but the world over. You know, you invite someone into your home, you offer them food. If you are someone who is a very uh, strict materialist on the way that you view these about these things about you know it is flesh and blood aliens coming down nuts and bolts spacecraft then it seems like perhaps it's being given for a more sinister motive perhaps to uh facilitate some sort of change to drug people to give them to make them unconscious to give them uh to erase their memories or something uh, and then if you sort of approach the entire thing from a consciousness angle, it becomes apparent that maybe it's perhaps some way to facilitate communication. Perhaps it's a symbolic way to facilitate communication between the other, whatever it may be, fairies, aliens, or in some cases, Sasquatch, um, and the witness. Uh, but yeah, it is interesting because it's it's hard to draw any real solid conclusions because this doesn't happen in any case. I think that its prevalency in these sort of encounters is – uh, very much underemphasized, very much underestimated. Uh, but at the same time, it's not uh, it's not something that you commonly hear in every single encounter of aliens, fairies, or Sasquatch. But it's just frequent enough to make you sit back and say, "Is there possibly a purpose for this?" Yeah. Because at the end of the day, yeah, I was going to. S- at the end of the day, many of these encounters are brief. Oh, sorry. <laughs> yeah, what I was going to say is, it's. I, I understand what you're saying about. It possible to facilitate communication. However, in your book, there was case after case after case of where facilitation of communication is abruptly brought to an end upon the the ingestion of some of these substances. So it it is it remains a mystery. You know, uh, they are just having tea with you. There is some type of reasoning for the offering of these things. It knocks you out often. Absolutely. I mean, so so many of these encounters tend to be relatively short. I mean, even if you look at a longer example of missing time and abduction lore, um, not extremely long, but sort of a mid, mid-length, four hours. I mean, I can have someone over in my house and I don't have to give them something to eat or drink over the course of four hours. Perhaps it's polite, but if I'm not that concerned about politeness, I probably wouldn't be taking them against their will in the first place. So it really does suggest that there is some sort of ulterior motive. Now, it's interesting because uh, in the food taboo, the traditionally held fairy food taboo, uh, the consumption of food from the other means that you will stay there forever. You are trapped with them. And yet time and again in the actual practical applications of these stories, we see uh, people who are given food and do return. Of course, if people were given food and didn't return, we would never hear those stories because they would just disappear into thin air. And this is why some people – I'm not entirely sure that I see this connection, but I understand why they came to it. Uh, see some – draw some parallels between my work and the work of uh, David Politis, the missing 411 gentleman who's chronicled uh, missing people from around the world. But uh, I think it's interesting that – yeah, as you said, uh, the, these people are often given food just before they're released. So we have to sort of look at what this means in terms of uh, being given food and never returning. Does it mean that in some sense we can never return home? You know, Do you need to sort of interpret this from a more uh, metaphorical angle? You can never return home because you're always – you're constantly changed. The world will never be the same. Um, or you know, does it perhaps mean uh, in some cases, in some ancient uh, Teutonic – uh, fairy myths. There were maidens who were fairy maidens who stood by the side of the road and would give you a wine that if you drank it, you could go home, but you would be driven insane because you wanted to return to them. So there are multiple ways to interpret this. Uh, but you're right. The, the the idea that it's given just before someone is released is 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 a common motif. Another common motif is the is the correlation that many witnesses make between these uh, foodstuffs, often beverages, in fact, most frequently beverages. And uh, the loss of memory as well. Sometimes they, they feel that there's some direct correlation between being given this substance and them actually gaining amnesia. 
Yeah. Now, if we if we turn more to the area, uh, less the Ferry and Sasquatch area, and more to the uh, area of aliens, and let's just assume now we're going to adopt the ETH theory as being true. Um, if aliens are from some other, let's say, planet, for lack of a better term, they seem to be slightly different in that they aren't necessarily trying to nourish anyone. Many of these substances that seem to be given to either abductees or contactees almost seem... Um, in some way to be meant to facilitate a change perhaps in the human. Yes. I mean, I, I would, I would definitely agree with that. It seems, um, I mean, <laughs> given, given the history of, uh, modern ufology and sort of the directions that it's gone with, uh, talk of hybrid programs and alien interest interest in reproduction it 's kind of hard to not view some of these uh offerings as sort of rapey um in the sense you know in the in the sense that it 's almost like trying to erase memories of horrible things that have happened to them yeah uh but it does seem to always it, it, it very rarely does someone take something and not feel some sort of change i mean if you look at the early contact e literature um there are quite a few examples of people being given foodstuffs by uh, by aliens, and often these would somehow raise the consciousness of the consumer, according to the uh, according to the witnesses. Or uh, in some other examples, it would allow um, them to uh, breathe on their home planet. And a lot of a lot of the contactees were whisked off to alien worlds. Uh, but in every case, it always seems to have some sort of change. Uh, looks flash forwarding to the modern era. Not only do you have these. Um, examples of people being given something and then blacking out but you also have uh examples where uh, some people who claim to have uh, hybrid children uh believe that it's actually some sort of uh, multivitamin to sort of amp up their immune system for their hybrid babies um i'm not sure if any of those if any of those are 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 the are the right answer but i think they're all worth considering um because at the end of the day, we really don't have any answers, and we have to consider even the most outlandish of possibilities. Yeah, and that's that's if we're going to take the uh, ET hypothesis as a given, and we don't, and um, there's no reason why we should. When I was reading your blog, specifically the magical swimming pool of ufology's future, now this is the blog you do weird words and brass beats. This was June 23rd, 2016. And it was kind of talking about uh, scientific materialism as it looks at, you know, the nuts and bolts space inquiry. We can't really look at it as nuts and bolts because what we may be looking at is a non-materialistic phenomenon and you can't bring nuts and bolts and the normal scientific inquiry to something that is not material. Yes, yeah, so uh, I um I I didn't really expect this particular entry to get as much attention as it did, but um it's something that I've been thinking about for a while because really I mean if you look at if you look at a lot of consciousness studies nowadays there's plenty of peer reviewed evidence uh, of 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 experiments that tend to suggest that we play a greater role in defining our own reality. Um, you look at the work, I'm thinking specifically of folks like Dean Radin, uh, who has shown that uh, there's actually a, a microscopic reaction to people who are about to see an intense provocative image, often sometimes in this particular experiment, a violent or, uh, or pornographic image. He would actually register a systematic body response a fraction of a second before they actually viewed that image. Um, and then you look at some people like the work of uh, Rupert Sheldrake, who has pro pro proposed that uh, there's a morphic resonance model wherein uh, certain – certain the, the simplest version is to say that there are self-organizing systems in uh, biology that tend to inherit memories from other systems. So uh, one, of the, one of the common anecdotes is that if you teach a rat on one side of the country to run a maze and you find another rat – on the other side of the country to run the same maze, it will generally run it faster than the rat on the other side of the country. The idea that somehow this knowledge is shared, um, and these are not these are not particularly out there uh, researchers. I mean, they they really have done their homework and dotted their uh, dotted their eyes and crossed their t's. Um, Pim von Lommel had one of the 
um, longest longitudinal studies about uh, near-death experiences in uh, cardiac arrest patients. So it seems to me that there's something more going on. Materialism, I mean, <laughs> materialism still has its place. I mean, I'm not going to uh, step in front of a train, but it's not the only game in town. And this concept coupled with uh, the fact that so many in the ETH community, the people who really propose or, or are proponents of the extraterrestrial hypothesis, are quick to cite telepathy and uh, and extrasensory perception and extrasensory effects on witnesses. These two things coupled together really seem to me that we should at least be entertaining alternative ideas for what the UFO phenomena in particular specifically may be. I mean, if, if you're saying that ETs have harnessed telepathy, and this is a very mainstream ETH view, then you're already playing by uh, non-materialist rules. You're already in the consciousness bandwagon. I mean, even if you say that, well, it's because they've evolved so much that they've evolved these powers, you're still suggesting that there is something about the underlying nature of reality that is not explained by the material nuts and bolts paradigm. Well, yeah, I, I And would... if that's the case... Oh, sir, go ahead, sorry. I, I was going to say, yeah, the... You know, Albert Einstein, when he when he looked at quantum entanglement, he called it spooky action at a distance. It's it is a proven type of non locality, and I think early on in physics, when Einstein took a look at this, people, scientists in normal physics, have been trying to find their way out of that because it's hard to explain. But the more they try to find their way out of it, quantum physics sends them right back to spooky action at a distance and a whole lot of other mind-bending things that cannot be explained with normal physics. There's something there that we have yet to really grasp, and it has to do, I suspect, with consciousness being a thing that is not entrapped in our physical brain. The mind is out there, probably connected with God only knows what, we could even call it dark energy at this point because we don't even know what dark energy is. It could be that type of thing. Uh, it's, it's a huge mind bender and normal science is beyond what they can manage right now in my opinion. Very well spoken, and I would I would agree with every single point that you made. Now I, I know that a lot of people would probably sort of uh, <laughs> would sort of balk at these ideas, but it, it isn't saying that we we have to, or even that we should, throw out the idea that there is a physical component to the UFO phenomena. I mean, as I mentioned earlier, there are physical trace uh, evidence. There's physical trace evidence in countless encounters, um, which suggests that there is some sort of objective reality, but I think that whatever the intel UFO intelligence is, uh, because I do think that there is something that isn't explained by unconventional aircraft or misidentification, whatever the UFO intelligence is, it's using some of this, um, some of this aspect of reality, some of this consciousness-based aspect to accomplish the things that it does. And I, I, I have to arrive at that conclusion it's one of my it's one of the stronger views that I have because it's the only thing that explains so much of what happens. And you know, I, I find it always interesting that people don't really want to admit that uh, a, a large portion of of abductees experience experience uh, extra extrasensory perception and, and various uh, sort of psi phenomena. People don't like to tell talk about the fact that uh, you know Betty Hill, that darling of UFO phenomena, had experienced her entire life premonitions of uh, friends and loved ones dying in car accidents. It's a it's a not often talked about fact, but it exists. So it seems to me that we are much more tied up in in this whole phenomena than uh, than we would be if there were just little green scientists coming down from Zeta Reticuli. Yes, but now let's let's uh, visit the thoughts of Jacques Vallée, and and I know you're well read on him, and you've made a few references to him. Now you know he had a real uh, change of view when he began to look into this phenomenon closely. And I think it might have come somewhat from the fact that he's a computer programmer, and he started looking at this from from that vein. And I kind of am where he is taking us at this point in my thought that 
this might not really be reality at all, and you'd happen to mention back there a few moments ago a shared reality, that what people perceived as a um, a hole or an imprint in the ground as a physical thing may just be a shared idea of what physicality should be. And it really makes you have to stop and think about the nature of reality. And then I got to reading about how the Japanese, some physicists proved that we could be living in a holographic universe in that nothing is real, it's all just a gigantic, elegant program. Well, it's it's sort of the the, the idea, sort of almost this this solipsistic notion of, you know, what, can I, I'm the only person who can guarantee my material existence, what if everybody else is a figment of my imagination? That's the narcissistic take on it. But, you know, it really is this idea that, uh, that perhaps the entirety of of reality is is a sham. And, you know, I, I recently said to a, I recently said to Micah Hanks uh, once that uh, if I'm if I were in a conference building and there was a talk on uh, you know the Socorro case, <laughs> the UFO landing case, the Socorro case, or if there is a talk on how human beings perceive the world around them and how perception influences our worldview, I'm going to make a beeline for that one <laughs> because I think that there's probably a lot more truth of of determining, you know, the root of these phenomena in in, in that sort of a lecture. And that's, again, some people will say, well, this means that he thinks it's all in our minds. No, I very much do not. I think that there is some sort of objective intelligence, some sort of objective other that does interact and interface with us. But uh, I think that it's really wrapped up in a lot of... Uh, and a lot of our own baggage, as my good friend B- Greg Bishop says, you know, what are we bringing to the dance? What are what are we bringing to this experience? And are we perhaps uh, facilitating some sort of co-creation? We see something that our minds can't wrap around, and we interpret it through our own cultural, personal, um, you know, species-based lens. If there's something that's so alien in the in the uh, indescribable sense, not necessarily in the extraterrestrial sense, but if there's something so alien that we see, our minds are going to try to shove it into a particular box. And if we can't shove it into a box, then what happens? Well, we might very well graft our own interpretation onto it. So, Joshua, that then brings me to what is your belief as to what is happening around us? What accounts for all we see? Well, you're going to ask for a fierce agnostic to to to, uh, to, to make some sort of – to pick a side. Um, you know, I, I do think that this this entire bag of tricks, as it were, is indeed tied into consciousness. Um, I have – of the things that I still entertain, I have uh, – I still very much entertain the idea of a possible spiritual dimension. Um, I And I don't necessarily mean that in a, a Judeo-Christian sense. Um, even though I am a Christian, I don't necessarily restrict that to you know angels or demons. I think that there's probably a lot more wiggle room in there um, for the sort of spirit entities. Um, but I do like this idea that, that we bring something of ourselves to whatever we see. Um, I'm not I'm not a big fan of ideas like holographic universes just because to me it seems to fall into some sort of trap where because it's possible it must therefore be likely. Um I, I don't know. I just I don't I, I see as a thought experiment it makes quite a bit of sense. But I am not sure that it really holds any any stock in, in my way of thinking. Although I will remark um, that uh, if we think about the way that the uh, the our universe works, you know, the first law of hermeneutics, as below, as above, so below. You know, a leaf looks like a mirror, a small mirror of an entire tree. Um, it's interesting to note that in a lot of uh, video games, uh, non-player characters, the players that are controlled by the computer, actually have to have an entire map of the level inside their head. I heard this on a podcast recently. Um, which is an exact expression of that same sort of uh, governing principle that our universe works on. You know, things at a small level mirror things at a large level and vice versa. But having said that, you know, the idea that we're in a holographic universe just doesn't really, doesn't really resonate with me. Like I I think it does with some people. Um, I've, (laughs) I've all but written off the ETH from most sightings. Now this certainly doesn't, um, doesn't, 
mean that I don't think it has never happened. I mean, I think that if you look at the span of human history, I think it's very possible that we have been visited by a physical civilization from another planet. I just don't think it accounts for the lion's share of what we run into, simply because you do have so many, you do have so many uh, encounters that that a bump up against you know high strangeness, as it were. So, like I said, I'm sort of in, sort of sort of edging towards a more spiritual consciousness based model. But even then, I don't think I have even I don't think I have even a quarter of the answers. Um, I think that we're dealing with a massive puzzle, and there are you know three or four pieces that we have put together, but there's no picture on the box, and we're missing about <laughs> about sixteen pieces. Um, and I don't know if we'll ever be able to piece it together. Maybe the act of piecing it together is the point. You kind of sound uh, like you're tiptoeing around the multidimensional kind of theory of things. Things are extruding into our dimension uh, as they wish, when they wish, because they can. Yeah, I mean, that's, well, I mean, it sort of all comes down to semantics after a certain point. I mean, if if we look at, I mean, I think that you could easily look at a, a more spirit-based model and easily argue that it's, you know, it's a variation on the dimensional model or, or vice versa. Um, but yeah, I think that in terms of, in terms of the most popular uh, theories that have some sort of meaning for me, I, I would have to say that the, uh, the multidimensional model is one of the stronger ones. My problem is that I, I really don't think any of us really know what it means. I mean, we, we understand that, you know, according to quantum me- mechanics, there are certain uh, there are certain universes, certain alternate realities that branch out from every decision. But having said that, in some sort of really concrete way, it's not something that you can really reach out and grasp. So, I mean, I suspect that our notions of of talking about uh, of talking about spirits and the like might well be a, a metaphorized way to, to 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 express those those universal truths. Hmm. Well, I I'm rather uh, at this point in time, and it could change because as you gather more information and you go through life, things change. But at this point in time, to me, what makes sense is, and this is going to be weird, but you know, the Big Bang, they trace the Big Bang back to where it began. Mm -hmm. And to my mind, what if the Big Bang, that beginning was when our elegant program came into effect? (laughs) I can live with that. You know, I, 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 no, I, I totally am, am I'm on board with an idea like that. I mean, I, I still think, I mean, you mentioned that idea being sort of off the wall, but I don't, I think it's actually in a lot of ways more plausible than the ETH, you know, and I, I'm always terrified of the day when I, I, I've, I've come to a conclusion because I think that part of the point of, of this for me is to never really come to any conclusion, to constantly be pushing myself to think in, in new and different ways. And, and an idea like that, that we are living in a simulation, I mean, it has quite a bit of, parsimony in the way that it explains our our reality i mean that we, we've what we've done with our uh our machines all around us is create a really again a really good metaphor for this larger existence that we're living and if you look at uh if you look at again sort of returning to the idea of valet and you know control mechanisms um you know being being in being a uh a tech guy like he is um, I think there's a lot of a lot of power in those metaphors. I mean, it's it's easy to write off you know synchronicities as as a glitch, or you know to to suspect that there is some sort of system operator that is has certain mechanisms in place to accomplish certain things. And every now and then we uh, see a little bit of the code as it as it, as it travels by. So no, I don't think that's a, I don't think that's an outlandish idea at all. Mm. Well, yeah, I have a problem with a lot of scientists who um, are really uh, in a way, they're very small-minded, and uh, they've been really indoctrinated by by regular science, for lack of a better term, and they are not thinking outside the box. That That's rather unkind, I suppose, because science and scientists are very important. But it's the scientists who are not going to look at at things outside the explained. If a scientist knows that an inexplicable thing just occurred, 
and he doesn't go dig and try to find out what that is, then that is not much of a scientist. And that seems to be what is happening a lot in science as it regards this topic of of aliens and UFOs and anomalous things. There are books written of genuine anomalous things that are piling up in a dark corner somewhere and scientists, very few, are turning the light on and starting to sift through any of that. If they did, things then could perhaps be made more clear. You would find chunks of a puzzle into what is happening around us. But when scientists are fearful, and they literally are fearful of going in there, it's a third rail for them, they will not look at anomalous evidence because it scares the hell out of them. They don't know what to do with it and they know that their colleagues will chide them and there will be problems. And that is unfortunate. All I have to say to that is bravo. I mean, it's it's magnificent. Very well put. It, and sort of the problem with modern discourse nowadays is that you cannot say these sort of things with automatically without automatically getting labeled as anti-science. And that's not at all the case. I mean, science, especially Western medicine, has done great things. You know, my my, my mom is able to walk right now because of, of science and because of Western medicine. I'm I'm anti I'm not anti-science. I am anti well I'm anti two things. I'm anti um this this modern cult of personality that science has grown up around. You know, I find it incredibly ironic that the people who dismiss everyone involved in a religion as being, you know, uh, as as being deluded, while they still <laughs> talk talk about Neil deGrasse Tyson in hushed tones, um, but I also am am highly critical of the manner in which, as you said, science just chooses to ignore some things. Uh, you know, the idea that if it can't be replicated in a lab, then it must not exist. Well, you know, th- the world is not a lab, and some things may very well have happened that will never be replicated again because it's. It's entirely, uh, it's in, you know, it's, it's it's entirely unlikely, but it doesn't mean it hasn't happened. One of my favorite Charles Fort quotes is, "Science is a turtle that says that its own shell encloses all things," and I think that that's a pretty accurate summation of sort of the the uh, the scientistic doctrine that we're sort of finding ourselves in nowadays, um, where we're told that things are simply impossible, even though, you know, even though we have eyewitness testimony to the contrary. Well, we can't put it in a cage and, and stick it with electrodes so it must not exist. Well, that's not that's not the way the world works. Yeah, yeah. Well, I think we'll probably bring this to an end here pretty soon, Joshua. It's been awfully nice talking with you. Is there any other things you would like to impart? Um, no, just thank you so much for having me on here. Uh, I really do appreciate it. Um, I try to keep a uh, regular uh, blog presence. It usually ends up being about once a month, probably. Uh, my first book is a Trojan feast. It's out available on Amazon and, uh, Barnes and Noble in both ebook and, uh, paperback and hardcover versions. Um, I should be having a second book coming out this September from anomalous books as well. So keep an eye out for that. And you can find me on a pretty much weekly basis on the, where did the road go podcast at where did the road go Dot com, where I speak with uh, several good friends of mine on uh, both current issues and uh, in-depth, uh, in-depth examinations of subjects, as well as uh, sometimes we uh, take a look at uh, different uh, unexplained media and try to make heads or tails of it. So those are, my, uh, those are my three main places. When's your new book coming out and what's it called? Um, it's coming out, I think we're aiming for September, although it's looking more like October. I've been sitting on it for six months already. Um, uh, but uh, it's it, the title is the tentative title is Uncommon Sense, and it's it's taking a look at uh, cataloging uh, and trying to find some sort of meaning in the uh, consistency of smells across all different aspects of the paranormal. Um, you know, one of the things that uh, you know we always think of the devil smelling like sulfur, but uh, there are actually uh, quite a few. I would suggest maybe if not a majority, then a plurality of UFO uh, sightings that indicate some sort of sulfurous smell. And there's also, uh, you know, many accounts of Bigfoot smelling like rotten eggs, which is, of course is hydrogen sulfide, which many people equate with sulfur. Um, and so there's a real consistency across all that. And so trying to figure out what that means, you know, I think that um, anyone with a 
with a strict Judeo Christian perspective would say it means that it's all the devil. Well, I don't think it's that simple. Um, <laughs> I think that there's something, I think that there's something else uniting everything through the smell of sulfur, but it's not just sulfur because, you know, you have to talk about the outliers too. So I go into all okay. sorts of things, you know, there's, I talk about the smell, the smell of the craft and the cash landrum incident, you know, the smell of the bodies in Roswell, the smell of, uh, you know, talk about the smells of fairies, talk about the smells of chupacabras, the smells of the men in black, the smells of <laughs> all these different things. So uh, it's it's it was it was one of those books that I, I when I finished it, I'm like, I see why no one did this, because it's a pain in the butt. <laughs> <laughs> but it's another compendium of a niche area of this of this whole uh, subject, which is excellent. Yeah. Yeah. I was I was quite I was. Yeah. So I'm. I'm eager to see uh, what happens with that. So uh, it, uh, my uh, Patrick Weege and Anomalous Books is editing it right now. So I should be hearing back soon with his edits, which is a whole new process in and of itself. Well, I can certainly recommend a Trojan Feast. I'm enjoying it very much. And as the gentleman who wrote your foreword, uh, what he wrote was that most people would not think that this was of any import to write. But when you look at it, you are compiling instance after instance of experiences that have been noted. You take a look at this, you compile this data, and you drop it out there and say, here it is, folks. Folks, this now is a compendium of things that have happened, a small little niche of this whole anomalous area, but it matters now that that is compiled and people can take a look at that. It's an important work, and I thank you for writing it. Well, thank you so much for those kind words. Yes, I, I, I think that, you know, if there's, if there's sort of a takeaway from what I do in general, I hope it's that people realize that the answers, or at least greater insight, might lie in the tiny things that no one's paying attention to. That was Joshua Kutchen, blogger, podcaster, and author of A Trojan Feast. You can find out more about Joshua in our show notes links at apicasefiles.com. I'm Marsha Barnhart, your host for this Episode 3 of API Conversations, which is a spin-off of API Case Files. This podcast is a production of Aerial Phenomenon Investigations. The spoken content of API Conversations is distributed under the Creative Commons Attribution Sharealike 4.0 license. The theme music for API Conversations is by DJ Spooky and is licensed under Creative Commons. Check out our other API Conversations podcasts as well as our API case files at www.apicasefiles.com Thank you for joining us for API Conversations. Please share our programs with your friends. <laughs>